I just wanna take this brief second and let you know about our discipleship classes that are happening at the church. And we call them our four C's of discipleship. These are four commitments that we make where we wanna know about Christ and we want to serve Christ, we wanna grow in Christ and we wanna go and tell people about Jesus. And so through the month of November, we are gathering together on Sunday nights and just helping us be better disciples for Jesus. So if you're interested in that, come on out to the church at 7 p.m. on uh, Sunday nights in November, and we will get you connected to become a more authentic and available disciple for Jesus Christ. Hi, my name is Pastor Chris and I'm the pastor of Pinewoods Chapel here in Angus and we are so glad that you've gathered with us online today as we get together and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I just want to tell you a little bit about Pinewoods. We're a non-denominational Bible-believing church in Angus, Ontario and we just want to see our community reached for Jesus and to disciple people in the knowledge and information of Jesus Christ. This Christmas season, we will be gathering a number of times as we get close to Christmas to celebrate what Christ has done. And I just like to take this opportunity to invite you out. And I know these are stressful times with a second wave and everything else that's happening. But I just want you to know that uh, we're gathering on Sundays at 9 and 11 a.m. And gathering in person is safe and it is a great way to encourage each other so you can gather this christmas season with us in person you can do it in watch groups you can bring your group your social bubble over to your home and watch a christmas service online you can also get involved in our uh, online small groups some way uh, but we just really need to be connecting and encouraging each other uh, through this Christmas season as we celebrate Jesus Christ in the midst of this pandemic. So, great to be together this morning. Uh, I hope you can connect with God and with others uh, uh, this time as we gather together online. So let's just take a minute and we'll pray and then we'll get right into worship. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can gather together today in your name. I pray that you would encourage our hearts today as we worship, as we hear from your word. And Lord, just take the distractions of our world off of us right now as we focus in on developing a relationship with you, God. So God, we give you praise, we give you the glory, and we ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.
It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. Psalm 92, verses 1 and 2.
peace like a river attendeth my way when so So great to be together this morning as we're worshiping together and celebrating what Jesus Christ has done. Today we're looking at Daniel again because Daniel is just proving himself to be such a faithful witness in the world that he is living in. And we are called to be that same kind of faithful witness in our day, in our generation. And uh, God is actually looking for people. Did you know that? God is actually looking for people. And uh, one of the things that's so amazing about Daniel is that Daniel had a heart that was after God. And it was that heart of faithful witness to God that sort of set him apart from everybody around him, but also set him apart and God took notice and special care and attention to him. Today we find ourselves in Daniel chapter 9 and uh, we're looking at what does a 
faithful, the heart of a faithful witness actually look like? And the whole context of Daniel chapter 9 is that Daniel is sort of in his room, uh, spending time at home, and he's uh, doing some reading, and he's reading from the prophet Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah was also uh, a contemporary of Daniel's, and he wasn't in Babylon. He was actually over back in Jerusalem, and he was prophesying and telling people what God wanted them to know. And one of the things that God had decreed if these people of Israel had not repented and, and turned to Jesus, to God, then they were going to be sent into captivity through the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And what we find is Daniel reading these prophecies and really trying to understand about what's happened and why has it happened. And in this, we just see his amazing heart for God, for his people, and we see the integrity and desire he has for God. So as he sort of reads this, he sort of gets struck and he begins to pray. And I'm going to read the prayer and then we're going to get into just unpacking what uh, Daniel's heart actually looked like. And it's a great example of what our heart needs to look like today when we find ourselves in this ungodly, secular kind of world that we're living in. So let me read Daniel's prayer. And it starts in Daniel chapter 9 at verse 3. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love for those who love him and keep his commands. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. As at this day, the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that we have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we've sinned against you. To the Lord, our God, belongs mercy and forgiveness. For we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by the servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice and the curse and the oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we've sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity, calamity has come upon us, and we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now therefore, O God, listen to the prayer of your servants and to his pleas for mercy 
And for your own namesake, O oh Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Pretty amazing prayer. This is Daniel's heart as he's just pouring it out to God in this time of captivity that he finds himself in. And as he's studying the words of Jeremiah about the 70 years you can find it in Jeremiah 25 where the prophet Jeremiah prophesies about 70 years that Israel will be held captive by Babylon. Well, right here in Daniel, we just see this amazing uh, heart display in his prayer. And we see what a heart of a faithful witness actually looks like. And we're going to go through some things this morning that uh, really tell us what that, what that is. Well, here's the, first, the very first thing is we see a faithful heart seeks God. So Daniel's been reading about this uh, prophecy of the seven year, 70 years of desolation for Israel and Jerusalem, and it's found in Jeremiah 25. And he, verse 3, then turns his face towards the Lord and seeks him by prayer with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And he says, I prayed to the Lord my God. You see, Daniel seeks after God, and he's got this phrase that's written there that I turned my face, meaning I've turned my whole life, all of my energy, uh, seeking uh, God through this activity of prayer. And not only am I praying to God, I've got this posture of humility and repentance. I've taken time to pray, but he's prepared himself too. He's actually been fasting. He's actually changed his clothes. And in, in that day, when they were putting on sackcloth and ashes, this is what they literally did. They took off their garments and put on a cloth, like we would call it like a burlap sack today. And they took ashes from the fire and rubbed them on their head. And that was to illustrate their repentive posture, to just get broken before God and change their perspective. He altered his schedule. He altered his eating. He altered everything so that he was able to devote that time to seek God. And that was in his heart. And this prophecy that Jeremiah had, speaking of the 70 years of captivity, moved him to the point where he thought it would be a great idea to do this. And so let's just unpack this for us. You know, what would you do if you were told that you were going to be in jail for 70 years? <laughs> um, some of us might get down on our knees and, and pray. But you see, Daniel was already in captivity when he's reading this. And I'm sure that he was actually kind of like, okay, let me get my head wrapped around this. There's 70 years that are, that's coming where we're going to be in captivity. So when did that 70 years actually start? Did it start when Daniel uh, went off into Babylon when King Nebuchadnezzar took him? Or did it start in this year of Denarius or Darius? Or when Jeremiah, the prophet, actually gave the prophecy. See, there's a, a number of things that he didn't understand about this. But yet, even though he didn't understand, and even though he knew he was already in captivity, he didn't shrug it off, he actually spent time to pray. So what would cause you and I to actually be moved to seek the Lord? Well, a lot of us, we seek God when there's trouble in our family. Maybe we've had a bad day. There's a health issues going on. But do we seek him out of a faithful heart? That no matter what situation we find ourselves in, we are seeking God. 
You see, most of the time we seek God when we are in these kinds of problems. And we're not really just seeking God for communing with Him. We're seeking God as a solution to our problem. But Daniel, he's already in captivity. He nowhere in this prayer prays for him to be released from captivity. I find that very interesting. Him seeking God is not for his own circumstance. It's actually for the circumstance and the demise of his people, of his family, not his own situation. You see, this is what a faithful heart who's seeking after God actually does. They're more concerned about the bigger picture. They're uh, faithfully seeking God on a daily and a weekly basis, searching for truth, searching, seeking, because that's really what seeking is. It's searching out something. It's seeking out this understanding and this truth of this whole situation. And this is something that you and I need to be doing on a regular basis as we're seeking after God. Because it's a sign that we actually have a faithful witness to God when we're completely changing our schedules, changing what we want to do today, tomorrow, and centering in Jesus Christ in the midst of this and seek Him. And it's one of the huge marks of what it looks like to have a faithful witness. The second, the second characteristic of a faithful heart that's witnessing to Jesus and to God is that they confess sin. I want you to notice in, in verse 4, he says, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrongly and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets. Wow. Here's a man who for all intents and purposes from what we see in the book of Daniel, is living a godly life. But yet here he gets down on his knees and he's seeking God and he confesses his sin and the sin of his people. Charles Spurgeon said this, he said, I firmly believe that the better a man's own character becomes, the more joy in the Lord he has in his heart and the more capable he is of sympathetic sorrow and probably the more of it he will have if you have room in your heart for sacred joy you have equal room in your heart for holy grief you see when we do wrong we feel guilty we feel grief and our response to that should be to confess confess to god but daniel was confessing on behalf of the people israel and from verse 6, and in fact, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, 16 has the plural pronoun where he is uh, confessing on behalf of the children of Israel. When was the last time you personally confessed to Jesus? And if you're like, well, I can't remember. So you're sinless? He's never sinned? You see, confession should actually be something that's a regular discipline in our life. We need to actually get down on our knees and confess because we're sinners. And we need to confess that we have chosen to go, on, to go away from God and not run to God at times. And we need to confess that. We just say, God, I've been running away from you. I'm sorry. Would you have mercy on me? Would you forgive me? And sometimes we actually need to confess the sin of Christians to Jesus. And maybe it has to do with our church. Maybe it has to do with, you know, your small group. Maybe it has to do with two or three people because you were kind of gossiping about somebody or, or being mean or something. You see, there's so many times that we need to confess in our regular life. And it's just a part of our natural bent towards God 
if we're being a faithful witness to do confession. In John, uh, the letter, the first letter that John writes in John 1 9, he says, If we are if we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, this is, this is what God does when we confess. And that's why confession is so important. Yes, we confess to Jesus when we come to Jesus. But confession is this ongoing, it's this continuous thing that we are doing on a regular basis. And it actually keeps us humble. It keeps us in this place of uh, humble service and faithful witness to who God is and who I am in the relationship with Jesus. So may we, may we all have this heart that is a faithful in confessing sin, keeping the short account of sin with God and with others. And if you want a great marriage, confess to your spouse when you're wrong. And if you want a great relationship with your kids, confess to your kids when you're wrong. And if you want a great relationship with Jesus, confess to him that you're a sinner and that sometimes you just continue to sin and you just need to come to him because this is the mark of this faithful witness, this heart that is bent towards God by seeking the Lord and confessing our sins to Him. Here's the third character that we see in Daniel's heart here as he's praying. You see, a heart that has a faithful witness prays for mercy. Verse 17 and 18, he says, Now therefore, O oh, oh God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy, for your own namesake, O oh Lord. Make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. When, the, when was the last time you prayed and asked God for mercy? You know, so many times when we pray, we're, we're praying and asking God to do something about our situation. God, would you just do this? Would you fix this problem? But that's not exactly what Daniel says. And in fact, Daniel doesn't pray asking God to take them out of captivity. In fact, he had just asked for mercy. Mercy is God's kindness and compassion that only comes from Him. It's a plea. It's begging. Just for mercy. Is that what our prayer sounds like? Most of the time we just tell God what He should be doing. But our posture here, Daniel's posture, is God have mercy on us. For we are sinners. Sinners, And you know, what this does is it, he's acknowledging and taking responsibility for the wrong that's done and just falling on the mercy of God. And this is maybe something we don't think about very much, that God is so merciful, he's so compassionate, he's so kind. And Daniel shows that he knows this about God and he doesn't really get into these long flowery things other than saying, God, have mercy. And he falls on that. And through any hardship that we are in, that is what our prayer can be. God have mercy on us. And maybe today you find yourself in a situation that's difficult. Maybe this pandemic and everything that's going on with the second wave is just overwhelming you and something's happening in your family. And maybe you even haven't found a job yet after all of this going on. You just need to fall down on God's mercy. And plea and cry out, God, would you just have mercy on me? Because really, that's what God's looking for. You see, not only is he looking for people that will seek him and confess their sins, but he's looking for people that will fall on his mercy. And that's what a faithful witness does. And we need to be living our lives in our world today just like that, where we're just falling down on his mercy. And, you know, because Daniel is in this place and he's pleading for God's mercy, it touches the heart of Father God. And God actually does something in the midst of this. 
And this is kind of what we would all like, sort of like the end game. Oh, this would be so great if we could have this. But I really want you to see that it actually takes someone who's seeking God, someone who's confessing their sin, someone who's falling on the mercy of God to get to this next stage, which is receiving understanding. You know, a heart of faithful witness receives understanding. So here we have this, this picture as we continue on uh, through chapter 9. So it actually uh, tells us that Daniel has this encounter again with the angel Gabriel. And as Daniel is busy praying, the angel Gabriel shows up. And he has this moment, this encounter And it actually says in verse 20, he says, while I was still speaking and praying, confessing my sin, I had this vision with the angel Gabriel. And this is what the angel Gabriel says to Daniel in verses 22 and 23. He says, he made me understand speaking with me and saying, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. You see, because he had been in this place of confession and seeking the Lord and falling on God's mercy, it moved God to act and bring understanding to Daniel's situation. And from time to time, we all find ourselves in situations where they're hard to understand. And we we may even say, I don't understand. I don't know why this is happening. And Daniel has this posture. And that's what a faithful heart does. And when God sees this kind of faithful heart, it causes him to respond with this, understanding. And God loved this. And it actually says, the angel Gabriel tells Daniel that you are greatly loved. Wouldn't that be amazing for that to happen to you in your situation? You're kind of struggling with this whole thing and you've just been seeking the Lord and you've been pressing in to know him more and and confessing your sin and, and falling on your face and falling on his mercy. And you get this angelic encounter with the angel Gabriel, and he tells you that you're greatly loved. Well, you can know that today for sure through Jesus, that we are greatly loved through Jesus. But God reveals the deeper meaning of this whole prophecy of 70 years and gives the meaning and timeline to Daniel for Jesus. And this is, this is incredibly important because not only is God wanting to deliver his people from captivity, but he's also wanting to tell people about Jesus and his return. There's almost a universal uh, agreement among Bible scholars and commentators that this reference to the 70 sets of seven weeks or weeks of years is speaking about the Messiah Jesus coming. In ancient Hebrew, the weeks simply referred to a unit of seven. And the Hebrew word that's actually used here is often used to mean a unit of seven days, but it's also used for a unit of seven years. And so when this uh, prophecy came through Jeremiah about the 70, uh, the 70 years of captivity, And Daniel was reading this and trying to wrap his head around what God was actually saying to his people. He was coming from it from this perspective of these unit of seven or sets of seven years or weeks of years. And when you actually sit down and do all the math, Gabriel's message to Daniel is simple and it's actually incredibly striking. It's 483 years, that is 69 units of seven years would pass from the time of the command recorded in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 8, until the appearance of the Messiah, the Prince. 
And their 70 weeks are divided into three parts. We see it as we read through the rest of chapter 9. There's seven weeks and then 79 years until the city and its walls are rebuilt. And that takes place in real history. And then the 69 weeks, that's the 7 plus the 62 as it's broken down, bringing us to 483 years from this decree that Jerusalem will be rebuilt that happens in Nehemiah until the Messiah, the Prince, appears. And a final 70th week to complete the prophecy. Now, most scholars believe that the 70th week is is yet to be fulfilled as it speaks to the restoration of Israel and the Antichrist in the end. But what we actually see here, and this is what's so crazy, we see prophecy that is fulfilled right to the day about the return of Jesus. And when you take the, the calendar of the Israelites at the time of Babylon and you take the number of weeks and years that are mentioned here of 483 and you add them all together and you come right into the middle of the ministry of Jesus. And in fact, there's a passage in the New Testament in the Gospels where Jesus actually says, on this very day, these things are fulfilled. And a lot of scholars believe that what Jesus is speaking of on this very day, he's talking about this prophecy that was given through Jeremiah and deeper revelation through Daniel to the coming Messiah. You see, when we have this faithful heart that's bent towards God, and we're seeking Him, and we're confessing our sin, and we're uh, trying to live our life and falling on the pleas of mercy, it moves the heart of God to reveal to us, to His people, revelations about who He is. And this is exactly what happens in this moment. And God gave Daniel understanding. May we have the same kind of, and maybe we've got things going on in our life that we're just kind of like, oh, I don't know what this is, is all about. But if we get in this posture of this place, we see this promise. And this is not the only place that this happens. This shows up so many times in Scripture where we are in this place and God just pours out understanding in our lives because that's who God is. He wants to guide His people. So let's have this faithful witness, this heart that's bent towards God. Let's seek Jesus. Let's confess our sin. Let's pray for mercy and watch God through the power of the Holy Spirit give us understanding of what's actually going on in our world today. I want to encourage you to just give your heart and life over to Jesus. If you've never said, Jesus, I believe in you and I put my trust and my faith in you, I believe that you died on the cross for our sins and I want to live eternally with you. If you've never done that, if you never responded to that invitation by God to come and follow him, then do it today and seek him. Confess your sin. Call out for his mercy and he will just show you his great love for you. And if we have been responding to the invitation of Jesus our whole life and just wanting to follow after him. Continue to do that. Continue to seek him. Continue to pray for God's people. Continue to seek his mercy and know that God is there through the power of the Holy Spirit just to give us understanding in these crazy days that we find ourselves in where the world around us is not following Jesus. May all of us be following Jesus today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the example of Daniel, and I thank you so much that we can learn uh, from him. Lord, I just pray today that we, that everyone that is hearing this would seek your face, that we would actually confess our sins and and if we have to confess our sins to uh, to people lord i just pray that you move on our hearts to do this but god first of all that we would confess our sins to you and that we would just pray and ask for your mercy to be poured out in our lives that we wouldn't be concerned about our problems but just ask for your mercy and god that in the posture of being this faithful witness to you that you promise and that you give just understanding in this place. 
So God, I pray that you would open up our minds to understand your word, that you would open up our hearts to follow you because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we pray and ask all of this in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. It's been great that we can gather together to get today online and I hope you've been encouraged in our worship on the screen. You've got some questions for small group discussion or if you're having a watch party just to sit down and, and maybe you're just sitting around uh, the table somewhere with family or friends. Uh, here's some questions for you to discuss. Know that you're loved by God and we'll see you next week if not before. this place again with your song flood our thoughts with wonder and awe give us a great glimpse of an ever changing God all we want hearts now to yours every fear bow down to your love that we could see like never before give us a greater glimpse of an ever changing God Freedom.